Hey everybody, welcome back to Conscientious Summonvore. My name is Pal. It's been a long time since I've done a live stream, and uh, I hope everybody's well. It's been quite a hectic uh, last few weeks for me, so it's been a little bit difficult to try to get videos together. Uh, but I want to really start off the new year right, so I wish everybody a happy new year. I hope everybody's holidays were good. If you got to enjoy them with friends and family, um, that would uh, be the best. But uh, anyway, let's get right into it because I don't have much time. I'm going to have to get going pretty soon uh, for nighttime uh, stuff with the kids and get, getting them ready for bed. But uh, I've got a doozy of an episode for you guys today. I've been wanting to share this with you for quite a few weeks. Um, a while back when I read these, um, you know, these articles that I'm going to go over with you guys today, I was uh, super excited about them and uh, could hardly wait to share them, but uh, now's the time. So I'm not going to really um, you know, waste much time here, just jump right into it. I hope that as people come in, uh, you guys can let me know if you hear me okay. Um, as far as I can see, the sound should be okay. Um, the typical computer noise is probably still the same. Uh, the camera I bought uh, a while back turns out to be complete garbage for uh, doing any kind of webcam stuff. The audio is terrible, so I will be in the market for a better camera uh, soon. But for now, this is the best I can do, so hopefully everybody can hear me. If anybody in the chat can just let me know if you're uh, able to hear me okay, that would be awesome. And I'm going to just jump right into it. <coughs> All right. So a while back um, on Twitter, somebody shared this. And uh, this article is actually from a number of years ago, but I was absolutely, like, floored by it. I mean, I could not believe, uh, you know, kind of the, the stuff being shared here. It's a pretty incredible tale and um, I just wanted to share it with you guys. So uh, this is a blog post by somebody called Seth Yoder, I believe his last name is, but um, this is from a number of years ago. It's from 2014, it looks like. And uh, it starts off with this cute story about him going to the University of Washington and taking a uh, graduate course on nutrition and metabolism. And basically, as he says right here in the title, or the, the first sentence, the entire class was caught plagiarizing. And then he goes on to explain how basically people were recording the lecture from the professor and then they would take turns, the students in the class would take turns um, basically, you know, typing out all of the uh, lecture and making notes and then people were using that to study and also to complete assignments. And what ended up happening is because they were all sharing the same transcribed uh, notes, they were often just copying and pasting um, things from it. Long story short, uh, somebody made a typo and um, everybody used the same <laughs> like wording and the same stuff and then they all got caught because they were literally just copying and pasting each other's answers and just basically only changing very minimal things. But because of the typo, he was able to realize that everybody was doing it. So he goes on to say, you know, what is the significance of this? Well, <clears throat> um, you know, if you're you know, doing um, any kind of uh, plagiarism, it kind of like calls into question your, um, you know, your, I guess like your reputation <laughs> in the um, education, uh, intellectual community, et cetera, et cetera. And what he uh, then goes on to show is that there are so many people who are basically committing plagiarism, ripping off the work of Gary Taubes when he is trying to uh, discredit the work of Ansel Keys. If anybody doesn't know about Ansel Keys, I highly recommend checking him out. Very interesting figure. Uh, back in the early 50s, he um, did a lot of work on kind of trying to figure out uh, various nutritional kind of um, you know problems and uh, things related to heart disease and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of the low carb, uh, paleo, keto, whatever carnivore community have um, you know basically made out Ansel Keys to be the devil. Um, in human uh, form and uh, you know um, how he's a terrible scientist etc etc and basically Gary Taubes is one of these people and um, this uh, article goes on and explains um, kind of the history of, of what Ansel Keys uh, became famous for and also how his uh, uh, works have been um, quite frankly distorted and um, you know that, that's what I want to talk about. So I'm going to go through some of these points here. I, I do recommend everybody read these though for themselves and look into it and, and maybe actually read the full studies just so you see kind of what's going on and get a better idea. But um, you know, here it is. 
uh, he says, you may or may not have heard of a guy named Ansel Keys. He was a Harvard-trained uh, physiologist and uh, epidemiologist. He did some research on human starvation in the mid-20th century before moving on to study heart disease, for which he is uh, probably most famous. In 1953, he gave a scientific presentation at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. The meat and potatoes of his presentation was subsequently published in the Journal of Mount Sinai Hospital, now known as the Mount Sinai Journal of Medicine, with the title, Atherosclerosis, a Problem in Newer Public Health. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> happy Veganuary to you too, Jutaro. Thank you, and welcome for joining. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So uh, basically, you know, he's just saying he doesn't know how high quality of a journal this is, but, uh, you know, he says it's basically like a monthly newsletter, but it was peer-reviewed and um, a little bit, uh, oh, sorry, a couple tiers above a monthly newsletter. So he goes on and he says that uh, it summarizes a lot of what's known about cholesterol and heart disease of various countries at that time. So this was back in 1953, bear that in mind. It is not terribly newsworthy. The only thing in the article that is of any note is a Cartesian graph of the relationship between the rate of heart uh, death from heart disease and total fat intake as a percentage of calories in a few countries. So basically what you have here is degenerative heart disease. It's tracking men from 1948 to 1949 it shows um, their ages are 55 to 59. And for these seven countries, um, you can see the number of deaths per 1,000 here. And it uh, plots um, according to their fat um, calories as a percentage of the total calories. So as you can see, basically the more uh, fat uh, calories there were, the more deaths there were per 1,000 from heart disease. And um, basically, uh, a lot of people have called this into kind of um, question of whether this was, um, uh, you know, accurate. And we're going to get into the details here. Oh, my goodness, Jutro, thank you so much. Uh, I see the super chat there. That is so cool. Thanks a lot. That is the very first super chat I've ever gotten. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> really appreciate that. So, um, Keyes mentions that only a few countries are available for any kind of real comparison at the time of publishing. Some countries he leaves out of the graph because of major population shifts or poorly maintained vital health uh, statistics. He does mention that there are good quality health uh, statistics available for many other European countries, but since World War II had such an effect on diets, primarily because Germany invaded, occupied, and rationed food, the food data of Nazi-occupied territories were left out. What is left? It appears to be a remarkable relationship between fat intake and death. So four years later, in 1957, a couple of researchers named Jacob, I'm not going to even pronounce the last name, and Herman um, published a paper titled Fat in the Diet and Mortality from Heart Disease, a methodological note that was critical of, of, of the above paragraph. So these two guys come along, Jacob and Herman, and they're basically um, saying that, uh, yeah, you know, um, Key's work is, is not accurate. This paragraph is, is not really, you know, right, and it's misleading. Um, hey Bev, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you for joining. So, uh, you know, they basically, yeah, they, they say here they decided instead to conduct their own statistical analysis of similar data. They didn't use the exact same data as Keyes used for, um, you know, for the reasons that um, Keyes used data from FAO and, and uh, World Health Organization from 1948 to 49. And these two guys used the data from 1951 to 53. They didn't exclude any of the countries from the analysis and um, instead, what is it, and for any reason, uh, choosing instead to include all the countries for which they had the data, which happened to be 22 countries. And when they plotted the number of deaths versus the fat percentage, um, uh, sorry, the calories um, coming from fat as a percentage, you can see that the plots were all over the place from the different countries. These, these numbers all represent one of the countries from the 22 countries. And um, what they, you know, what the guy in this um, in this article is explaining, as you can see, when the 22 countries were included in the analysis, the relationship between the fat calories and the heart disease mortality is not so striking. There's no there's no obvious line here. It's just kind of all over the place. Uh, however, despite not being as pronounced as Key's graphs, this one still clearly shows a relationship between fat and heart disease. You can still see an upward trend happening as the percentage of fat calories increases. So as you can see, there are more with the highest percentage coming from fat, there are still more um, deaths coming from the heart disease, but it's not as nice as smooth correlation as this previous uh, graph would indicate. Okay, so um, let's see, where are we? Here we go. 
So uh, these two guys also make the convincing case that comparing total fat to heart disease mortality is kind of lame. They argue that the types of fat, or in this case the sources of fat, are far more interesting. In the paper, they actually do some comparisons with heart disease and animal fat versus plant fat, and animal protein versus plant protein. And they find that fat from animals and protein from animals each has a much stronger association with heart disease than simply total fat. They go on to say that their analysis shows that plant fat and plant protein is actually negatively associated with heart disease and mortality. What that means is that if you eat your sources of protein and fat from plants, you're actually protected from heart disease. So here it is. In other words, plant, uh, fat and protein from plants might have some sort of protective effect against heart disease. So both Keyes and these other two guys assemble what is called a cross-sectional um, analysis, which in terms of observational studies is one of the weakest at least when it comes to trying to show any kind of cause-effect relationship. Both Keyes and YNH mention this and state that their results are merely an association and that more robust studies on the matter need to be conducted. Again, bear, bear in mind, these are some of the earliest studies to look at this kind of stuff, and this was back in the 50s. Indeed, Keyes actually goes on to conduct uh, such a robust study several years later, colloquially known as the Seven Countries Study. This was a very large longitudinal cohort study that lasted for several years. Quite a bit of knowledge was gained from this study, including important information on diet, exercise, smoking, obesity, serum cholesterol, and many diseases, including dementia, diabetes, and hypertension. In fact, data from the cohorts is still being published today. In terms of epidemiological studies, a large prospective cohort study like the Seven Country Study is about as strong as it gets. Of course, the results are not as definitive as a randomized control trial of the same scale and duration, but enrolling so many people into a randomized control trial of that size and time is effectively an impossibility. Um, plus, with a randomized controlled uh, trial, you can only ex examine one variable, but with a super large cohort like this, you can uh, look at many variables. So at any rate, the first of the many uh, seven country study reports published in 1970, 13 years after the, um, you know, the paper that was critical by Y and H, uh, and a full 17 years after Key's um, original presentation at Mount Sinai Hospital. So it is this study that becomes wildly influential and puts Keyes on the map as an elite epi uh, epide epidemiologist. So now here is where we get back to the opening part that I said about um, plagiarism. So <laughs> this guy has had, I guess, like previous um, you know run-ins with Gary Taubes. He really doesn't like Gary Taubes. If anybody doesn't know Gary Taubes, he's one of these like low-carb um, you know advocates and proponents. So here he says, in his whopper of a diet book, uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories, Gary Taubes blatantly lies about, or sorry, rather, makes a mistake when reporting the results of the Y&H paper. He claims that the link between fat and saturated, uh, sorry, fat and heart disease vanishes if no countries are excluded from the analysis. So this is Taubes in his own book on page 18. Um, many researchers wouldn't buy it. Uh, Jacob, uh, or sorry, Jacob Yerushalmi, who ran the Biostatistics Department at the University of California, Berkeley, and Herman um, Hillebo, the New York State Commissioner of Health, co-authored a critique of Keyes' hypothesis, noting that Keyes had chosen only six countries for his comparison, though data were available for 22 countries. When all 22 were included in the analysis, the apparent link between fat and heart disease vanished. As we have seen, the link between ha uh, fat and heart disease does not vanish. Moreover, Tobbs then says, Keyes had noted associations uh, between heart disease death rates and fat intake, uh, Yerushalmi and Hilbo point out, uh, but they were just that. Associations do not imply cause and effect. Uh, what follows is purely a semantic argument, but I would argue that correlations can and often do imply cause and effect. In fact, most researchers test hypotheses based off of observational studies that suggest some form of relationship between two things. Of course, correlations certainly do not prove causation, and no epidemiologist wor worth his or her salt would claim otherwise. Now, that's just of like obvious like when you notice a trend then you go and you start planning your um you know clinical trials and tests and you know more controlled uh experiments where you can focus in on those um small number of uh you know variables and i'm going to get into that in a little bit <coughs> after this um so here's where the where the guy is making this claim that uh, the fraud comes in 
Here's the crux of the whole post. Many people have been ripping off Taub's work. They have been ripping him off without attribution and making money doing it. You know how I know they are ripping him off? It's not just that their verbiage and syntax are eerily similar. Much like my old professor, <laughs> the clincher is that these journalists and bloggers and charlatans all make the exact same mistake Taub's made with respect to the Y and H paper. In fact, most of these authors make it painfully obvious that they haven't read any of the papers they are making claims about. Now, it's one thing to blog about, say, toasters and misinform your readers, but when you're dispensing health advice and you have no idea what you're talking about, well, that can impact people's lives in a very real way and a very negative way. So let's begin with the plagiarism parade, shall we? So um, I would just echo this person's sentiment 100%. Um, you know, these people are um, the cholesterol denying camp, as I put in the title of the video. They are peddling information that is actually incredibly dangerous. If people follow these, uh, you know, charlatans' advice, they will be eating really high amounts of saturated fat and cholesterol and working on getting heart disease. It's a very, very serious situation. This is not just some kind of trivial, um, you know, kind of thing to, okay, you know, you're a little overweight or not. You can get heart disease even being at an ideal weight. Um, it's not it's not something to laugh at and not something to trivialize. So Nina Teicholz, if anybody doesn't know Nina Teicholz, she's also one of these typical low carb, you know, high fat, keto, whatever, um, paleo uh, people. Uh, Mike the Vegan has done great videos debunking her nonsense on all sorts of topics. Go check some of those out if you, if you haven't seen those, they're great. And you can see her, her quote here from uh, this article. Everything's linked in, in this article as well, so you guys can go check it out. At the time, plenty of scientists were skeptical of Key's assertions. One such critic was Jacob Yershami, founder of the Bias. It's like she uses almost the same exact wording. In a 1957 uh, paper, Yershami pointed out that while the data from the six countries Key's examined seemed to support the diet uh, heart hypothesis, statistics were actually available, blah, 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 blah. It's like the same thing. Uh, Ms. Teicholz also says, prior to the above paragraph, the first scientific indictment of saturated fat came in 1953. That's the year a psychologist named Ansel Keys published a highly influential paper, Atherosclerosis, a Problem in Newer Public Health. According to Google Scholar, this highly influential paper that doesn't even mention saturated fat has only been cited 247 times since its publication, which spans 61 years as of this writing. Again, bear in mind that this article I'm reading to you guys is from uh, 2014, so it's about six years ago. These numbers might have changed since then, but I don't imagine they would have changed much. An average of four citations per year. It was cited me, uh, merely 99 times from the time it was published in, uh, to 1973, a full 23 years after its publication. Each report from the seven countries study, however, has been cited several thousand times each. Perhaps that's what Ms. Teichels is referring to, although if it were true, then she could not have trotted out the Yerushalmi paper, or maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about and just plagiarized Taubes and changed some words. See, the whole point is, um, uh, there is this kind of thing of like appeal to authority. A lot of people kind of correctly say that that's not something um, that is a an appropriate response to something as an intellectual challenge or whatever. You can't just say, well, I trust this person because they're a respected authority. Um, in and of itself, that al alone isn't enough to kind of like decide an intellectual debate or, a, uh, you know, a battle of the wits. But, uh, you know, when it comes to peer reviewed medical journals and writings, um, the number of times a paper is cited by other peer-reviewed medical journals uh, is some kind of indication, um, and it is a, a bit of a vindication as well for the, you know, at least what the, the community deems as worthy of being cited. If your study sucks and um, it's got all sorts of problems with it, it's not really going to get cited that many times. And that's exactly what, you know, this article is showing, that the original um, you know, work which had issues wasn't cited very many times. So that's the significance of that. Whereas the other one, which was much more robust and developed on, you know, a lot better data and um, better hypothesis, that has been cited, you know, thousands of times or whatever it was. <clears throat> so, hey, Vegan Splinter, shout out to Vegan Splinter. Welcome. Um, <laughs> glad you're enjoying it. Yeah, this is a doozy. Stick around. There's some crazy stuff here. So, um, yeah, so basically, you know, again, Ty Colts, like seriously, watch some of the Mike the Vegan videos on, on her as well. She's, she's a piece of work. This other person, Dustin Howell, I don't know um, this person. Uh, I'm assuming it's probably another low-carb, you know, keto, paleo person. 
Um, again, almost the same wording. At the time, many scientists were skeptical of Key's claims. Jacob blah 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 pointed out that while the data from the six countries supported the diet, that this, statistics were available from the 22 countries. When those countries were analyzed, they apparently linked between fat and heart disease. You know, so it's like the same exact wording. Here's another person, Jonathan Baylor, another kind of uh, link. You know, talking about um, you know fat facts, whatever. Again, referring 22 countries, the 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 significance disappears. Blah blah blah. Um, you know, here it is. When the data from all 22 countries in key study is examined, they showed no relationship. So they're <laughs> they're basically you know all copying what Taub said, and it's like <laughs> nobody's bothered to even look at the studies. Nobody probably has even read them. So this guy says, talk about hyperbole. He garnered a massive amount of press and then went on to uh, tour preaching the fat that eating fat is deadly. Eh? I don't think so. Maybe 20 years after it was published and for a separate reason. <laughs> um, furthermore, Key's presentation to the Mount Sinai Hospital wasn't a study. Even the published text could not be considered a study. You could maybe call it a review article or an editorial, but it definitely was not any kind of experiment with a hypothesis. I suppose you could technically call it a cross-sectional study, but that's a real stretch considering the Key's paper is 22 pages long and the study only takes up three paragraphs and one figure in those tw uh, 22 pages from data that is publicly available. It's not uh, much more than a footnote in the text. I have literally written more words <laughs> bitching about Nina Teicholz and Jonathan Baylor than Keyes wrote for his highly influential study. So it just goes on with more and more examples. I don't know this site either, Photo Calorie. Apparently that's another thing here. Again, they claim you know the, the 22 countries. Georgia ED, if anybody has watched my uh, live stream, I've done one about uh, Georgia ED uh, when she had the paper in Psychology Today saying how eating meat is essential and I did a debunking of that. Go check that out if you haven't seen it. Uh, almost again, word for word, <laughs> it's like, um, you know the same kind of nonsense here's the the person writing this um you know uh, article saying i think this is an example of what happens when you don't uh, plagiarize from the source and instead plagiarize the plagiarizers the errors start to compound in on each other evidently Yerushalmi and Hilbo are seers and wrote a critique in 1957 of a study that would not be published for another 13 years. <laughs> so here, the uh, the claim that um, Georgia Edie is making, where is she screwing up the year? Oh yeah, here it is. <laughs> so it's like, there are actually so many errors in that one paragraph, I don't even want to bother writing more. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, Georgia Edie, go go watch my video on, on her. She's, she's a be sword. Nathan Jackson, again, another person I don't know, probably the same kind of thing. Um, <laughs> the comment here is clearly English is not Mr. Jackson's native tongue. Um, I know I have a lot of uh, people who watch this channel who don't have English as their native tongue, so maybe I, I won't make fun of that because uh, I also um, started off speaking a different language besides English. So, but I, I don't know, I didn't even read this one in particular. Maybe there's something funny in their grammar, uh, but I don't know. Here's another one, uh, 360 personal training. Um, again, same thing, talking about um, 57 being the year that uh, Jacob and Herman, you know, published the paper. Again, that's wrong. It was not even in that year. So these people are just like getting all the data, the numbers, the, the, the very crux of the information that's being presented all wrong based on probably just copying the copier of the copier of the copier who copied, you know, <laughs> Gary Taubes. And um, I don't know if I really need to go on, but as you guys can see, it just keeps getting worse and worse. Uh, I think as it, you know, it's like the it's like the whispering game or whatever, you know, where somebody whispers and it goes into the next year, and by the end you get, you know, purple monkey dishwasher at the end. It's like this is kind of what's happening with all these people. Um, so here it is. This is this one's great too. Um, Chris Master John. I don't know who this person is either. Keys had presented data from uh, six countries purporting to show a clear linear relationship between the amount of fat consumed in a country and its incidence of heart disease. This graph is shown on the left. The one problem was that data was available for 22 countries at the time and including that uh, data de demolished the relationship. And then the, the point here is this graph actually appears in many of these posts. The right one is overlaid incorrectly because number 13 is Japan, number 12 is Italy, number 22 is USA, etc. So it's like they are now distorting the actual pictures too, and not just the you know the main point of the uh, of the data. So it's just it's like going from bad to worse. Another person here, Brendan Coburn, again, Paleo Leap, again, Craving uh, Fresh. I don't know many of these things. Maybe they were more popular back in 2014. 
um, Innate Fitness, Christopher Cleary, Colin E. Champ. I mean, it just goes on and on. I don't know many of these people anymore, so maybe they're not relevant anymore. Maybe they're not that popular. Maybe they've realized the error of their ways. But as you can see, the list goes on and on. Here's somebody I have heard of, Joseph Mercola. Um, this guy has uh, tried many, many times to debunk, you know, all sorts of kind of like plant-based kind of um, information. Uh, this one's just, you know, I, I know this guy. He's, he's a piece of work. Um, here, the person writing the article says, even Tom Noughton from the awful documentary Fathead gets in on the plagiarism. They have the video here. If you watch it, it's almost like verbatim taken from the uh, Gary Taub stuff with the graphs and everything. I mean, it's just crazy. So, yeah, here's the brief conclusion, and then we're going to just jump in to um, some actual data and actual studies and talk about uh, cholesterol and its role in heart disease. So uh, here we go. The hypocrisy here cannot be overstated. These authors are all accusing Keyes of academic dishonesty while plagiarizing Taubes or someone who else who stole his work and claiming to have knowledge of academic journal articles that they have almost certainly never read. Additionally, many of the blogs or articles mentioned here advocate pro-meat and pro-saturated fat diets, yet the central study they invoke as evidence against Keyes also happens to make the case against eating animal fat or animal protein because as it said right in the beginning, the study done by those two guys actually showed a protective um, you know, correlation of eating plant uh, fats and plant protein versus a, you know, a uh, pretty good um, correlation between heart disease of getting plant, um, animal uh, proteins and fat. So in case anyone wants to actually read the text and questions, I have a link to them in the end notes. Um, you can check that out. I'm going to have the links for all of these things um, in the end uh, when the video um, is done. And um, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, this is just really interesting stuff. I mean, I read this this uh, article or blog post or whatever you want to call it, and I was just actually floored by how many people are basically ripping off this information and presenting it as their own almost without realizing that it's it's actually wrong. So it's pretty amazing. I think there was actually a Vegan Gains video where he did, I think, a debunking of Adam Thinks or something like that. I don't even remember the name of the site, but there was a YouTube video that was trying to debunk um, Ansel Keys. Like a, this was like a long time ago. I haven't dug that one up, but I'm, I'm sure if somebody looks around, you can probably find that. And that was on Vegan Gains channel. And I remember <clears throat> um, a similar kind of thing where they were trying to show that uh, you know the the correlations don't happen if you include the 22 countries and blah blah blah. I'm pretty sure it was the same kind of thing. So that was probably another case of it. Um, what's coming here? Cholesterol hypothesis is incorrect because veins don't develop atherosclerosis but still have blood with cholesterol. I don't even know what you're trying to say here. So you're saying the hy the cholesterol hypothesis is incorrect because veins don't develop atherosclerosis but still have blood with cholesterol. That's, I don't even know what you're saying. Uh, uh, good luck trying to explain yourself, I don't know. Okay, so guys, let's jump in now to this uh, um, other article here. I'm gonna have the link again for this as well at the end. Um, this is a site called Science Based Medicine. I don't know uh, too much about them, I'll be honest, but uh, I did look through this article pretty um, intensely and read through the whole thing and man this was awesome. Just a really great history of kind of um, where studies uh, first started looking at the role of cholesterol into heart disease and cardiovascular issues and um, death from cardiovascular issues and talking about a lot of where the claims made by cholesterol deniers like uh, Lyotask uh, whoever. Um, here and um, elsewhere and uh, yeah basically this is just an awesome um, reference and I would encourage anybody if you're struggling with uh, you know talking to people and they bring up these crazy claims like feel free to use uh, a site like this where they've handily um, you know collected all of these um, links to the studies and, and references to actual studies that you can then look up and kind of explain to people and do more research so uh, basically here again, this is uh, talking about an article that appeared in um, The Guardian. Uh, this was from 2018. Actually, the, the article in The Guardian was from 2018. And it said, raised an interesting question. Is cholesterol denialism a valid form of skepticism or pseudoscience? Is there a valid debate surrounding the benefit of cholesterol medication? Or is the evidence and the scientific consensus clearly on one side of the issue? 
Um, it is true that we argue about cholesterol far more than other cardiovascular risk factors. It is hard today to find anyone who doubts the harmful effects of smoking, diabetes, hypertension, or the lack of exercise. So why is there a cholesterol controversy but unanimity in other risk factors? So first off, we should acknowledge that there is in fact uh, that there has been a controversy on, on almost all these issues at some point. And then they talk about how people denied the issue of um, high blood pressure um, or you know other kinds of things, and um, and this just goes through it. And then it says the fact is that those controversies are not new. We simply tend to forget that they happen because once they're settled, people kind of tend to get it out of mind, and it's you know it's just done and dusted. So he's basically saying the cholesterol controversy is a recent phenomenon because our understanding of cholesterol is relatively new. Diabetes has been described since antiquity and blood pressure measurements first occurred in the 18th century. But our understanding of cholesterol only dates to the beginning of the 20th century. One of the earliest researchers in cholesterol is Nikolai um, Anikov, I don't know, maybe, who in 1913 reported that rabbits fed pure cholesterol dissolved in sunflower oil developed atherosclerotic uh, lesions, whereas the control rabbits fed just sunflower oil did not. At the time, this research had little impact and its importance was only recognized in retrospect. Um, as Daniel Steinberg states, in the full significance of his findings, oh, sorry, if the full significance of his findings had been appreciated at that time, we might have saved more than 30 years in the long struggle to settle the cholesterol controversy and Anikov might have won a Nobel Prize. Instead, his findings were largely rejected or at least not followed up. Research, uh, serious research on the role of cholesterol in human atherosclerosis did not really get underway until the 1940s. And this is the reason why. Laboratories uh, tried to reproduce um, Anikov's results using dogs or rats, failed to show that a cholesterol-rich diet caused atherosclerosis. This likely occurred because dogs and other carnivores handle cholesterol differently from rabbits and other herbivores. This is, again, something I've talked about in other videos. Um, you know, this is a pretty good indication, or should be to people, that humans are indeed herbivores. This is the... Uh, you know, the belief of leading cardiologists, people like Dr. Uh, um, Williams, Dr. Uh, um, what's the other guy's name? Shoot, I can't think of it. Anyway, I, uh, I reference a whole bunch of stuff like this in one of my previous videos. It was one of the earliest videos I did about um, heart disease and other illnesses. It's largely based on Dr. Greger's uh, How Not to Die lecture. Go check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, so this led many to dismiss Anikov's results on the grounds that rabbits were not a good uh, model for human physiology and that his research was likely irrelevant to humans, um, which again, it's because people just didn't note the significance that the rabbits should be herbivores and that dogs and other carnivores are not. The criticism leveled against his research was not entirely unfounded and we have seen countless times how animal research does not translate into humans. This is a huge uh, area of discussion. I've done many videos where I talk about this as well and why I'm opposed to all uh, animal uh, testing. We should not be testing uh, anything on animals. Um, it's really pointless and shouldn't be used uh, you know, to do anything. It can lead us in the wrong um, direction and often give us you know, incorrect uh, conclusions. So um, basically, you know, he, this person writing this article is saying that to accept a lipid hypothesis based purely on this guy's uh, work, Anikov, uh, would have been premature. It should have been an invitation for others to pursue this new line of inquiry. <clears throat> and eventually in the 1950s, John Goffman would begin his research in lipoproteins and determine that there were different types of cholesterol. Today, of course, we acknowledge that low density particles like LDL are uh, athero uh, atherogenic, whereas high density particles like HDL are not. Goffman demonstrated this in the 1956 cooperative study of lipoproteins and atherosclerosis through, uh, sorry, although the distinction of LDL and HDL would only come later. There was a fair bit of controversy surrounding the study at the time. The study actually found two uh, discussion sections, oh, had two discussion sections, one penned by Goffman Group and the other by the other three collaborating laboratories in the study. The schism seems to have <coughs> occurred, <coughs> excuse me, over a technical point of cholesterol measurement with the others concluding that Goffsman uh, atherogenic index had no advantage over the simpler uh, measurement of cholesterol. They also maintained that lipoprotein measurements are so complex that it cannot be reasonably expected that they could be done reliably in hospital laboratories. Fortunately, our technical mastery of cholesterol measurement has improved considerably and people were soon able to conduct large-scale epidemiological studies to determine if measuring someone's cholesterol provided insight into their cardiovascular risk. Okay, so um, 
Now it talks about the epidemiology uh, um, studies. And so here it is. Despite the controversy that surrounded the cooperative study of lipoproteins and atherosclerosis, there was evidence that uh, cholesterol, regardless of how you measured it, was correlated with uh, coronary disease. And this is actually an interesting point. I had a debate with, um, uh, shoot, what was the guy's name? Something Waffles, BRB Waffles, a while back. And um, we talked a lot about um, cholesterol and my main argument in that debate was that everything he tried to argue about, you know, not being able to use, um, you know, LDL or, you know, some specific lipoprotein or whatever, uh, and it should be some other, you know, uh, lipoprotein and whatever, because it tracked better. My main argument in that debate was that they all tracked, <laughs> and some of them tracked even better than others, but they all tracked well with, um, and correlated well with the, with the heart disease. So, uh, you know, the fact that some um, of these markers are better indicators than others, um, you know, doesn't mean that, uh, you know, throw out all of it because we don't know exactly which one correlates the best. That's not how this works. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The, the work of Carl Mueller studying patients with familiar hypercholesterol, uh, can never pronounce that word, hypercholesterolemia was also largely supportive of this link. The work of Brown and Goldstein and their isolation of the LDL receptor would prove the genetic cause of this disease and win the Nobel Prize, but this work was still decades off. This is, again, people with a uh, genetic predisposition to um, high cholesterol. These people have high cholesterol regardless of their diet, and um, there are also people who have really low uh, cholesterol through a genetic uh, defect that's similar to this one, where no matter what they eat, their cholesterol levels stay really low. And, um, and I've talked about this in previous uh, streams as well. So anyway, so nevertheless, oh yeah, here it is. However, it could be argued with some validity that individuals with a genetic cause for their high cholesterol were not representative of the general population. Nevertheless, by the mid 1950s, there was enough interest in this new potential risk factor that large scale epidemiological studies were launched. The seven country studies has certainly been one of the most notorious studies of the period and its originator Ansel Keys has become a popular target for attack. This was uh, what we were just talking about. The main thrust of the attack is that he cherry-picked data in order to obfuscate the truth. But again, you know, <laughs> even this article says the reality is, is um, a slightly more nuanced and uh, detailed review of the seven countries, uh, seven countries study, highlighting the strength and limitations can be found here for anyone who's interested. Suffice, suffice it to say the main argument that can be leveled against the attempt to deny the role of cholesterol and heart disease is to point out that other studies have shown similar results. So they mentioned a few studies where, you know, they... Um, didn't uh, find um, as strong correlation or they found other correlations, et cetera, et cetera. And um, let's see, where did I want to jump to next? Yeah, suffice it to say, whatever criticism one wants to level against the seven country studies, uh, study, there was plenty of other data suggesting a link between cholesterol and heart disease. Not unsurprisingly, researchers eventually resolved to try and do something about it, and they started doing the actual diet studies. This is what I said before, yes, uh, correlation does not equal causation, but when you do have a correlation and it's so strong and it's been shown in so many studies, um, you do start doing the test to confirm whether or not that is the case, and that's what this next section talks about. So although there was a fairly good epidemiological evidence linking cholesterol to heart disease, um, uh, definitive proof uh, worldwide would require demonstrating causation, not simply an association from, from population studies. Given that medications to lower cholesterol were still some years off, the only available tool at this point was a dietary intervention. Importantly, many of these studies were not studies of a low-fat diet. The dietary intervention under study was usually replacing a diet high in saturated fat, i.e. fat from animal sources, with polyunsaturated fats, fat from plant sources, with the goal of lowering blood uh, cholesterol levels. And also um, something that uh, you know many times people uh, don't really acknowledge is that uh, like replacing uh, saturated fats with uh, refined oils f made from plants is still not a good idea and um, doesn't lead to great health um, outcomes. So that's another thing that oftentimes in these studies, uh, especially in the early ones, they were having people replace calories with oil, uh, which is not a good idea. So here it is. The Oslo uh, Diet Heart Study was one of uh, the first such studies and recruited 412 men for five years of follow-up. Um, those randomized to the intervention group of vegetable oil did in fact see a drop in their cholesterol level as well as a decrease in cardiovascular mortality, 79 versus uh, 94 in the control group. 
the difference in all-cause mortality, <coughs> 101 versus 108, was not statistically significant. The Wadsworth Veterans Administration Hospital uh, study was a similar trial. They had the advantage of a resident uh, population that could be randomized to one dining hall or the other, thereby ensuring good compliance with the study uh, allocation. 846 men in the study were studied for five years. Here, too, there was a reduction in major cardiovascular events, 48 versus 70, in the control group. Another study in Finland randomized two mental health hospitals assigning one to serve a diet high in saturated fat and the other a diet of unsaturated fat. As part of this, <coughs> uh, it's crossover design. After six years, the hospital assignments were switched. It significantly uh, included both men and women and demonstrated a reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Unfortunately, not every study of the time was positive. A study done by the British Medical Research Council found no benefit to a soya bean oil. Uh, serum cholesterol did fall in the intervention group, although the difference between the intervention and the control groups lessened with time, likely because of waning compliance. The number of cardiovascular events was lower in the intervention group, but the difference was not statistically significant. Another study testing corn oil found no significant change in the incidence of cardiovascular events, and one of the few studies to test an actual low-fat diet found no benefit to cardiovascular disease. All in all, the diet studies from this period suggested that lowering uh, serum cholesterol levels could reduce cardiovascular events. However, someone could justifiably say that the evidence to date was inconsistent. Uh, in truth, the negative studies tended to be smaller and more uh, were probably underpowered. Also, the positive results tended to occur in studies where the change in serum cholesterol was greatest. So, for example, the low-fat diet study showed no cardiovascular benefit but also had little impact on cholesterol levels. Uh, which likely explains why it was negative. Still, the mixed bag of trials from this period instilled in many a doubt that the value of cholesterol uh, about the value of cholesterol lowering. Unfortunately, many failed to appreciate a subtle point. A dietary intervention can fail to produce a benefit, especially if compliance is poor. But the failure of dietary intervention does not mean that serum cholesterol is unrelated to cardiovascular risk. And what I will also say here is that many people who are in this cholesterol denying camp, like uh, Chris Kresser, uh, going on Joe Rogan and you know citing all these studies these people are often citing studies from back in like the, the 60s and 70s and like when you know they could be looking at data that's available in hundreds and hundreds of um, you know uh, proper you know double blind um, placebo controlled randomized control uh, trials and they 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 conveniently ignore those and they they like to go back to these things that were done in the 70s that don't show these correlations um, but somebody who's not into this stuff and looking at this stuff you're not going to know they're you're just going to hear oh there's no correlation and, and you know that's what they're going to do so um, don't be fooled by this stuff and then here, by the late 1970s, there were pronounced criticisms by some regard, regarding dietary interventions for cholesterol lowering, regardless of whether these criticisms were deserved. Um, <coughs> let's see. Uh, but research into cholesterol uh, metabolism was providing new medications that might potentially lower cholesterol levels and reduce cardiovascular risk. Now, again, here, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically uh, they're going to bring up these studies that were done early on where they had kind of mixed results from the earliest um, cholesterol lowering drugs. So in this one, they basically showed that after five years, there was a decrease in cholesterol and a 25% relative risk reduction in non-fatal infarcts. So you would think that was, that was good, but um, it also gave further proof to the idea that lowering cholesterol prevents uh, heart attacks. Oh wait here, yeah, sorry, it, that, that was the positive. It was a positive study, but there were two problems. There was no difference in cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality was slightly worse for the people taking this drug, the, the cholesterol lowering drug. So more people actually died who were taking the, um, the drug versus the people who weren't. This increase in number of deaths was likely the result of random chance, but the idea that lowering your cholesterol could be dangerous has never really left us since. Now they go into another study. Here they had a reduction in the cholesterol, I think. Yes. But again, the trial showed that lowering cholesterol resulted in less cardiovascular events, so that's kind of the positive aspect. But here there was some uh, negative. Oh yeah, here it is. There was one bizarre finding to the trial. Although an all-cause mortality was marginally lower in the uh, cholesterolamine uh, group, there were a greater number of violent or accidental deaths in those who got the drug, 11 versus 4. But again, you know, you look at these numbers, they're really low. You don't know how big the, the trial was. I didn't look through the numbers. But again, these were some of the early um, results and they were less than stellar. So a lot of the people who are making these claims, they still refer back to these original studies, ignoring the fact that there have now been done, you know, 
hundreds of further studies with way more people and the meta-analysis of all those studies show you know uh, the efficacy and the safety etc and the, the article really gets into this as we go on here so um, these results again um, once again caused some concern that cholesterol lowering was dangerous people thought it could impair brain function all this kind of stuff and you know it's like you read this stuff it's like the keto clown carnivore people paleo people um, you know uh, like love this thing you need the cholesterol for brain function all this kind of stuff it's like your body makes enough cholesterol you don't need to consume dietary cholesterol but they love to kind of point to this that you know and they, they refer to these kind of studies that were made you know decades and decades ago and we've had many many studies um, since then but they love to ignore that so the idea that lowering cl uh, cholesterol can impair brain function keeps resurfacing. It's a common claim that statins can cause memory loss, even though the weight of the evidence suggests statins have no strong effect on memory one way or the other. Now they're talking about with two trials done. In 1984, the NIH convened a consens uh, consensus conference to review the evidence and establish guidelines. Their conclusions were that an elevated blood cholesterol level is a major cause of coronary artery disease. It has been established beyond a reasonable doubt that lowering definitely uh, elevated um, blood cholesterol levels, uh, specifically blood levels of low density, so this is the LDL, the bad cholesterol, quote unquote, uh, will reduce the risk of heart attacks due to coronary heart disease. The media was less favorable in their critique. The Atlantic famously ran a cover story on the cholesterol myth claiming lowering your cholesterol is next to impossible to diet and often dangerous with drugs and it won't make you live any longer. There was of course something to this criticism. If not impossible to lower your cholesterol with diet is very difficult. In many of the more successful diet uh, trials from the 1960s, the research subjects were residents in hospitals or other institutions which made controlling their diet fairly easy. Compliance in the community is of course harder. That it was dangerous to lower your uh, cholesterol with drugs was perhaps overstating the point. That it won't make you live any longer was technically true and all-cause mortality was not statistically uh, different. But it did prevent heart attacks and other cardiovascular events and clearly they would improve quality of life if not quantity of life. Uh, despite these nuances, skepticism about the benefit of lowering cholesterol remained fairly widespread. So again, this was back um, you know, in 1984. Then we get into the statin era when so many statins were developed and made available and they um, are now you know really heavily prescribed oh and one one thing that i just also want to mention here just before we move on is this claim that it's it's uh, Im almost impossible to uh, lower your cholesterol with diet this is just so patently fault i mean i lowered my uh, cholesterol levels i'm going to just check my numbers here on the side i have it open um and I talk about this in my presentation um, as well that I mentioned earlier, one of my earliest videos. My LDL uh, as an omnivore was uh, 118 and it fell to 58. <laughs> so, I mean, I just like, it's like almost cut it in half or whatever. And my total went from 189 uh, down to 104. So that was about a year after eating a vegan diet. So I think... I always say this to people, it's like, you, you don't have to listen to me, you don't have to believe me, you don't have to believe any of this stuff, you don't have to read this stuff. It's like, if you're eating the, you know, the diet you're eating now, which is probably, you know, laden with animal products, take a cholesterol reading. If you already know it, great. If not, go to your doctor, get, get one done, do a general health check, go on a, you know, whole food plant-based diet, make sure to supplement with vitamin B12, get enough, you know, uh, calories, and you know check yourself again in three four five six months however long you want to check and uh i can almost guarantee you your your cholesterol is going to get lowered you don't need to do anything weird you don't need to you know believe anybody you can just go check it yourself it's actually quite easy to lower your cholesterol if you're uh eating a whole food plant-based diet <clears throat> so anyway that's neither here nor there getting back to the article here the statin era um, when Akiro Endo uh, developed the first statin, I don't think anyone could have predict predicted how it would change the debate regarding cholesterol. Uh, this is talking about these different drugs. Never made it to market, but similar drugs like... I, I never pronounce these drug names very well, so I'm going to just skip the pronunciation. Would demonstrate how effective statins would be at lowering cholesterol and reducing cardiovascular uh, risk. If you compare the 4S study to the coronary primary prevention trial with cholesterol... This is that early one, as I mentioned above. Um, 
you can see how much more effective uh, the new uh, statin was than the previous, uh, you know, one from a decade before. So this one was done in 1984. This one, the 4S trial was done in 1994. Um, the first one included only men. This one included men and women. The total cholesterol was lowered 25% with the new drug, only 13.4% with the old one. They had a lowering of the LDL by 35% with the new one, 20 with the old one. Um, and, you know, they just had far better uh, outcomes. Okay, the 4S trial demonstrated not only greater cholesterol reductions, but also greater reductions in cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. The benefits were also significant in women and patients over 60, because those were some of the complaints and um, things that people had against the early trials. 26 randomized trials later, we can draw some pretty firm conclusions about the benefits of statins. There are many meta-analysis summarizing the data on statins and some are better than others. Judging the value of a meta-analysis is difficult, although I do not hold the whole joke that the meta-analysis is to, okay, blah, blah, I'm gonna skip that. Um, let's see here. The 2010 uh, meta-analysis summarized the data and had the advantage of using individualized uh, individual pa uh, patient data, which generally speaking, greatly improves the value of the analysis. Their findings are largely in agreement with the US Preventative Services Task Force. The summary showed that LDL lowering with statins reduced not just heart attacks and strokes, but also all cause mortality. For every one, uh, what is this, um, millimole um, per liter reduction in LDL. So um, basically, why is the controversy continuing? So the preponderance of the data from the statin trials were hard to reconcile if you wanted to maintain that cholesterol had no role in cardiovascular risk prevention. There was, of course, one possible position you could take. Maybe the benefits seen with the statins had nothing to do with their ability to lower LDL cholesterol. Maybe statins had uh, pleiotropic effects that acted independently of their cholesterol effects. For example, maybe statins had anti-inflammatory properties, and this is why they prevented heart attacks. A lot of these keto people, a lot of these cardio uh, carnivore people, a lot of these paleo people will say this, that it's it's not the dietary uh, cholesterol and the saturated fat that's causing you know the atherosclerosis. It's the inflammation, and then the inflammation is caused by the sugar. So <laughs> you know, this, this article gets right into this, this claim. There are two main counter arguments against statin pleiotropy. The first is when you re-examine the randomized uh, trial data, the benefits to statin therapy appear quite linear. In other words, statins that lower LDL cholesterol the most have the greatest cardiovascular benefit. Our group found similar results. Using statistical techniques usually used in the field of genetic epidemiology, we were able to reanalyze the data from the statin trials and determine that pleiotropic effects were probably negligible. As I uh, pithily pointed out to a friend of mine once our paper came out, we spent a great deal of time and effort trying to prove that cholesterol medications work by lowering your cholesterol. The second argument is perhaps more intuitively obvious to understand. After statins were developed, two new classes of medications came onto the market. Again, I'm not going to pronounce it. Blocks cholesterol absorption from the intestine and this uh, PCSK9 inhibitor uh, acts, um, sorry, inhibitors act via the LDL receptor. Both medications lower LDL and both prevent cardiovascular events, although the benefits of ezetimibe is relatively small. Importantly though, they act via completely different mechanisms from statins. When statins were the only medications on the market, you could maybe entertain the idea that their benefit had nothing to do with cholesterol. But when you have multiple medications that lower cholesterol via different mechanisms, still uh, all showing a consistent and proportional cardiovascular benefit, that argument becomes extremely untenable. The figure below demonstrates the point quite clearly. The cardiovascular benefit of different cholesterol-lowering interventions is directly proportional to their ability to lower LDL. <clears throat> so again, this is just, you know, this is what these keto carnivore clowns don't want to acknowledge. They don't want to acknowledge all the recent studies. They don't want to acknowledge, acknowledge that, uh, you know, if you look at stuff past the 1970s and early 80s, you're going to have really good data to base these claims on. And the common criticisms. This is probably my favorite part of the article here. The common criticisms. It would be tempting to think that the wealth of data that has ended, uh, sorry, has ended the cholesterol controversy, but it continues to this day. Common criticisms leveled against this hypothesis usually follow predictable patterns. One, carbs are the real enemy. Again, this is what, what I just mentioned above um, earlier. The criticism against Ansel Keys and the low-fat diet in general usually get extrapolated to mean that cholesterol is good for you. It is worth remembering that the diet trials of the 1960s were about substituting saturated animal fats with polyunsaturated vegetable fats. Again, usually oils, as I mentioned. They were not tests of low-calorie versus low-fat diets. And I would also add not just low-calorie, low but 
but low animal uh, fat and animal protein. Um, you know, a whole food plant-based diet always does well in these kinds of things. And it has been the only diet that has ever been shown to reverse heart disease. So whatever these carnival people claim, never forget that, that Dr. Esselstein, Dr. Ornish, and similar people have demonstrated heart disease can be reversed by following a whole food plant-based diet. No other diet has been shown to do that. <coughs> Also, before going down the rabbit hole, that is dietary epidemiology and the problems with interpreting the plethora of con contradictory research on any subject regarding food, it is worth saying again, the real issue is not the cholesterol in your diet, but the cholesterol in your bloodstream. Lifestyle factors like diet and exercise certainly have a role in cardiovascular risk reduction, but we now have medications that can accomplish degrees of cholesterol reduction substantially greater than you can achieve with lifestyle changes alone. I take issue with this statement. I absolutely, uh, you know, can show with my own blood work. I'll probably do a separate video showing you guys my numbers, but uh, I basically cut my cholesterol in half with dietary changes alone. So I think this is just a load of bollocks, but that's all right. Um, no one is debating that eating lots of candy is bad for you. I would agree with that. What we are talking about is uh, here is treating hypercholesterolemia. Uh, so this is again people with, with high um, cholesterol. That should be non-controversial treatment strategy. Uh, argument number two, doctors overprescribe statins and lifestyle changes are the best. The argument that we overprescribe statins and that people should just eat better is a fairly, excuse me, fairly prevalent one. It is actually in direct opposition to argument one and fails to acknowledge that the dietary trials of the 1960s were only modestly and inconsistently effective in lowering cholesterol and preventing heart attacks. See, again here, I would say I kind of partially agree with this because if people don't stick to a whole food plant-based diet, um, then of course they're not going to see you know the, the benefits. You have to actually stick to the diet that is healthy. Um, and, and again, if you are downing, you know, processed foods, sugary foods, things laden in uh, high fat, high saturated fat, you know, coconut oil, for example, that's probably not going to give you the, the reduction in cholesterol that you want to see. So I'm not saying that uh, you will be immediately healthy just by eating a vegan diet. A vegan diet can be anything. You can be literally eating, you know, Oreos and beer and, and you know, chips or whatever. And and uh, you're not going to be healthy. So that should be obvious. And I've said that many times in videos too, so I hope nobody confuses that. Um, so uh, also an increasing amount of evidence suggests that we should be pushing cholesterol levels even lower than we currently are. Again, I've said this before as well. Dr. Greger has awesome videos about this. Um, even people like, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Lauren Cordain, I think is his name. Uh, I can't remember the guy. He's one of these big paleo people. Even he has a study that shows that the natural... Um, healthy uh, cholesterol levels, you should have um, your, uh, you know, target right here. The LDL should be below 70 milligrams per deciliter or, or the 1.8 millimoles per, per liter. So, um, you know, the, the levels that people have now are actually too high. Usually I think people say you can be over like, uh, I think like 90 uh, for the LDL is what usually you see people, but, but ideally you would really want to be at 70 or lower. Um, so yeah, that's very interesting. And I think mine, what did I say mine went to? I'll check my number here again. Um, my LDL went to 58, so well below 70. Okay, um, number three, statins have not been shown to be effective in women or the elderly. This is again, often repeated, but not true. Early trials were done exclusively in men and women have been historically underrepresented in clinical trials, but starting with the 4S trial, again, that's the one that was done in 1994, thousands of women have been enrolled in statin trials and subgroup analysis uh, show their effects to be similar to men. Similar subgroup analysis is for people over age 75 also show benefit. So again, these are the Chris Cressors of the world basically pointing to studies that were done, you know, in the 70s and in the early 80s and stuff like that and ignoring all the subsequent, you know, dozens of trials that were shown with large sample sizes to be of benefit. Argument number four, statins don't work for primary prevention. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force uh, disagrees with this point. There have actually been many studies looking at statins in primary prevention, people who do not have established uh, cardiovascular disease. The benefit in primary prevention is certainly less than in secondary prevention, but the benefit is still there. <clears throat> Again, the lower you are, once you're down below this 1.8 um, millimoles per liter, you pretty much have zero uh, chance you know, of um, dying of heart disease. <laughs> this is pretty much what uh, this, this chart is showing here. 
So as the above graph shows, even in primary prevention, if you lower your LDL, you lower cardiovascular risk. The magnitude of that benefit is smaller than in secondary prevention, and you might decide that benefit is too small to justify starting a new medication. Again, I'm not telling people to go get medication. I'm telling people eat a whole food plant-based diet so you get your um, LDL below this point naturally, and then you don't have to worry about the heart disease, um, and you don't have to take the, medis uh, you know, the medicine either. As always, higher risk patients benefit most from medications, but the claim that statins have no benefit whatsoever is incorrect. Number five, statins are too expensive. Uh, as this correctly points out, you know, the, the real question is really just, um, you know, it's not a debate about whether or not the cholesterol lowering works. We're just debating whether it's worth the money or not. Again, that's neither here nor there about the efficacy. Argument number six, most people who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol. First off, as mentioned above, it is quite possible that normal cholesterol is much lower than we think it is. Um, blood pressures between 150 and 180, uh, which now cause great stress and anxiety in patients and sometimes bring them to the emergency room, used to be considered as mild hypertension and treating it was of debatable value. But as people's uh, understanding of the science gets better in um, human physiology and uh, you know nutrition, <laughs> so our knowledge should um, progress. And unfortunately with these keto people, it's not... <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, um, so nevertheless, there are some people who suggest that when you have a heart attack, having high cholesterol is protective. This observation is usually due to index event bias. This is a very interesting article. I would definitely recommend people actually read this link uh, about index event bias. I was not familiar with this term. Um, I don't feel comfortable enough to explain it myself because I haven't actually read the whole article but uh, this is a short summary. Much like obesity can seem to be protective in heart failure, so too cholesterol can seem to be protective in patients after a heart attack. The unfortunate truth though is that neither is good for you. Anybody particularly interested in event bias can read an editorial about it uh, that we penned in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. I haven't read that yet either, uh, but definitely check out both of these. I'm sure they're really good. This, this one I did read most of and it's very fascinating. So, um, Finally, if someone argues that most people with heart attacks have normal cholesterol, you can respond that most people with heart attacks are non-smokers, but smoking is still bad for you. The fact that risk factor is rare doesn't make it beneficial. I also doubt the fact that most people with a heart attack have low cholesterol, but after searching, I could not find good data one way or the other. Empirically, though, my personal experience suggests this is untrue. And I would, um, yeah, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would agree with that. Um, hey, Frank. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, join Discord. No, man, I, I can barely keep up with uh, with this. I don't think I'll be joining Discord anytime soon. But uh, I do appreciate you being on here. Okay, argument number seven. <clears throat> statins have too many side effects. Statins do have side effects like every other drug. We cannot deny this is the case, but we do not need to guard against hyperbole. People will sometimes claim that the rate of side effects with statins is nearly 20%, but this actu uh, actually falls and usually reflects a misquoting of the data. Complaints of myopathy are higher in observational studies than randomized trials, and few randomized trials specifically looked at muscle-related outcomes. The one trial that did stomp found statins did not de uh, decrease muscle strength or exercise performance, but there were more complaints of muscle pain compared to the placebo, 9.3 versus 4.6%. So statins likely do cause some muscle problems, although the risk of serious muscle or liver damage is very low. There also appears to be a nocebo effect at play. That's a very interesting effect as well. People should read up on that. And um, it is important to note that uh, being intolerant to statins does not imply that cholesterol is unimportant. When statins were the only feasible option in the market uh, for lowering cholesterol, the challenge of treating statin intolerant patients was difficult, but now the problem is easier. A statin intolerant patient who cannot tolerate even a low dose or a different statin can be switched to an alternative medication with a different mechanism of action. This is what the article mentioned above. Over the years, much cholesterol denialism has been focused on statins specifically, but with the advent of new and different drugs, this will become a much harder argument to carry forward. We should be cautious though, because new medications like PCSK9 are substantially more expensive than statins, and overstating the side effects of statins will only push more patients to more expensive medications. Also, there was a worrisome report that suggested that negative news stories about statins were associated with more statin discontinuation and a rise in heart attacks. Uh, while other factors likely also play a role, it should remind us that there are real world implications for patients who take these medications. Misstating the evidence has serious negative side effects. Again, you can follow the advice of these keto clowns, these carnivore idiots, and you can actually like kill yourself. You can actually um, have a heart attack. You can actually die of a heart attack. I was just on Twitter 
uh, earlier, I think it was last week, somebody was posting a screenshot from a Facebook carnivore uh, group or community or whatever where people were giving each other advice and all this kind of stuff. There was a lady literally posting saying that she'd been on the carnivore diet for I don't know however many months. It was probably like three months or something. And that she was um, having like, uh, you know, like head fog and all this kind of, this, these kind of problems. And um, she was saying she's almost completely carnivore, but she does have coffee and she has a almond, uh, you know, milk um, creamer uh, in her coffee and that was the only source of plant um, calories that she had was just the coffee and the and the almond creamer and um, people were and, and she was complaining about having chest pains and tightness in her chest and feeling lethargic and not wanting to get out of bed etc etc and people were <coughs> giving her advice to ditch the almond creamer and use heavy cream instead the lady is probably on the verge of having a heart attack. Her, 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 you know, veins are probably blocked to the point that it's actually giving her headaches and making her feel lightheaded. And people are encouraging her to drink heavy cream. It's like, oh my god, like what is wrong with people? I mean, they are literally giving her advice that will likely kill her if she actually listens uh, to that. And you know, this is why I'm doing this stream because people really need to go and look at this stuff. Uh, for themselves. I mean, this is this is just insane. You have to go and like read this stuff. You can't just take people like like Chris Kresser at his word. I mean, I haven't even watched the full spanking yet that was um, James Wilkes coming on Joe Rogan and totally demolishing Chris Kresser. But I mean, it looked like he was going to cry at the end. Chris Kresser got beat so bad in that debate. These people make all sorts of claims. They have nothing to back it up except stuff from the 1970s or older. And um, when you actually go and do the research, when you actually go look at these things, you find that all these claims are just beyond ridiculous. They're they're absurd. And uh, yeah, basically, here's the conclusion. <laughs> cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease. Over the better part of a century, cholesterol has been examined as a possible risk factor for heart disease. There have been many criticisms along the way. Some are justified, some less so. Animal studies in rabbits cannot be applied to humans. Diet studies are often ineffective. Early drug trials were non-exclusive, blah, 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 blah. But all these criticisms belong to a different time. There are studies in humans. We have moved past diet studies for lowering cholesterol. Women are included in the studies. There is a mortality benefit. Statins and other medications do work by lowering LDL. Statins are now generic. There are alternatives to statins if you have side effects. The thing about cholesterol controversy is that most of it has been settled. Some issues remain. Maybe it is better to measure uh, t uh, to non-HDL cholesterol or APOB cholesterol instead of LDL. This was, again, the stuff we were debating with BRB waffles. But this is a subtle point. And a finding a better way to measure something does not negate the underlying truth that high cholesterol increases the risk of heart disease. This was my exact point with uh, BRB waffles. Go check out that debate if anybody hasn't seen it. There was a time when someone could be skeptical about the role of cholesterol in cardiac uh, risk reduction. That time has now passed. This is my point exactly. And uh, I'm going to have to get going soon. So I'm going to switch back to the camera here. And I'm going to go through the comments because a bunch of comments just came in. I haven't been able to follow them. But uh, that's that's the presentation. So I hope everybody stuck with it. I know it was a lot of stuff and a lot of reading and whatever. But I just feel like you need this stuff. When you talk to these keto clowns, these like carnivore idiots, I mean, like you really need to like be able to pro point to the data. I was so impressed by James Wilkes on the Jerogan podcast. Like I say, I haven't even watched the whole thing yet. But I mean, he just... I loved his approach. I mean, he demolished Kresser, Kresser. Like, he just, he beat him so bad. It was like, I think, like, uh, Quality Gains or whatever the guy's name is. He said uh, he, he might not even be able to call himself vegan after that because he just slayed him so bad. I mean, I agree. I loved, I loved what he did because after every single point that he showed Kresser was just undeniably wrong, he would get concession from him after every single point. He was just like, do you admit that that was wrong? And Chris was like, Yes. It was like, so you admit that what you said was incorrect and this is actually correct. Yes. It was like, it was just awesome. Oh man, Jutero, thanks a lot for the super chat. Again, that is awesome. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Okay, let's scroll back here. <coughs> Juice, hey man, uh, welcome. Hey, I'm actually very strict zero carb after being vegan. I managed to cure my digestive upset and worsening acne. I'm fully clear now. Okay, so you're very strict zero carb. So you are a full carnivore, I imagine and you were vegan. I'm not dogmatic and I'm open to the other view too. Okay, well, I hope you can watch the stuff I just covered because I think you really need to be careful. 
Um, Frank, you have adopted an elimination diet. You have not cured anything, merely reduced symptoms. That is a perfect summary of the way I feel about these kinds of things for people who see benefit to uh, carnivore or you know zero carb or whatever you want to call it. Um, Juice says, I've tried reintroducing a ton of foods and most of them give me acne except some fruits. Even fish and eggs give me acne. Um, <laughs> what is wrong with acne? What's wrong with it? It's not supposed to happen. It's not normalized in our modern society because everyone has it. Uh, no tribes have it. And it's depressing to have. I agree. Uh, severe acne is definitely a problem. I mean, getting an occasional pimple here and there is different than having, like, severe acne. Yeah, severe acne sucks. I think a lot of people actually get severe acne from dairy. Uh, dairy is actually really, really, uh, like, bad for people's uh, complexion and skin and all this kind of stuff. So that's, um, but I would go back to, to what Frank said. Elimination diets do usually help people with, with severe issues because you're not, you don't know what it is. It's, it's probably not one thing. It's probably multiple things that might be causing you issues. And um, by just going to something so restrictive, um, you know, you could just pick like, I'm only gonna eat, you know, uh, foods that start with the letter Q or P or I don't know, whatever. And you would probably have achieved the same thing you know, by random chance, uh, if you've just avoided the same foods that were actually causing you illnesses. Um, the other problem is that, as we've seen with many people who have gone from, like, vegan to, uh, you know, some form of car uh, carnivore or zero carb or whatever you want to call it, um, their gut biome changes. And so after a while, uh, you can no longer even eat the things that wouldn't, wouldn't have caused you problems in the past because your gut biome is not set up now with the with the healthy bacteria that can digest the things that you should be eating like sweet potatoes and and you know stuff like that so uh it's it's really not a good idea and i think you really should get help from an actual specialist don't take my advice don't don't just look at some youtube videos like go actually see you know doctors who know um something uh you know a fair bit about digestive issues and uh and yeah do research and 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 keep reading and look at you know some of the really excellent um, you know, work put out by actual nutritionists and, um, you know, some of the vegan doctors. Um, and and I, that's what I'd recommend to you. Okay. <clears throat> but I would agree, severe acne is not normal. Definitely not good. Um, uh, okay. Um, yeah, so Ju Juice is saying stay vegan and stay bloated. No, I'm not saying, I'm saying go get help. Um, but going on a carnivore diet is not going to help you. And it might give you temporary relief, but... Uh, yeah, that's not going to be a solution for you, buddy. Um, uh, to, to, to Jen, hey, Jen, welcome. Cresser has another debunking on his website. Same old Tosh claims Wilkes has lied and cherry-picked. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's like you can't get any better than his performance there. Like, uh, he had nothing to say in that in that uh, exchange with Wilkes. I think he just was totally demolished. Um, um, to, 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 yeah, sorry, sorry, Frank, I'm going to disagree with you. I think uh, severe acne and scarring is definitely not a good thing. It should not be happening, and you should go seek actual help, and, and uh, you should be able to deal with that while maintaining a vegan diet. Um, but again, vegan just is an ethical thing. Uh, that has nothing to do specifically with what kind of diet it is. Um, you can do a, a vegan elimination diet. If you just switched to, you know, like an all-rice diet and, and some, um, you know, uh, some vitamins and, and uh, supplements, you may have also alleviated your symptoms and then been able to slowly reintroduce stuff. Or, or a sweet potato diet, uh, again, with some supplements, you would be probably have able to achieve the same thing. Um, right now, you might not be able to switch back to that so easily without some other kind of issues being you know settled because your gut biome does change when you eat a really heavy meat diet. But uh, I think you definitely need to go, go see an actual specialist and, and get help. Um, <laughs> Jen says, uh, Joe Rogan has gone carnivore for a month. I can't believe that. Wow. I mean, he even posted, he was saying he was going to remove Cresser's uh, original debunking because he thought it was so bad. The guy's crazy. I don't know. Or he's just so paid off by his sponsors that he'll, he'll just do anything like, like the raw what's-her-face doing the carnivore diet for 30 days. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Jen's recommendation of watching Brian Turner's playlist on acne, that's a good one. Um, okay, uh, Jen's asking if you've done the FODMAP thing. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, thing. With It's supposed to help with bloating and everything. Yeah, really sorry for you, man. I, I, I can only echo Jen's sentiment there, too. I really think you need to go see actual help. Like, don't, don't just be bumming around YouTube videos and trying to cure it yourself. You've you got to go see somebody. 
Um, you suspect isotretinoin being the main driver. I don't even know what that is. And overconsumption of anti-nutrients causing leaky gut. Uh, I don't know what that is. Um, anyway. Uh, Jutaro says, not saying it's cause of the diet, but my mild acne went away a few months after going whole foods plant-based. I mean, I... I have never really had an issue with uh, acne. I mean, I would get the occasional pimple even as an adult, but I, I certainly didn't have severe acne. Um, I think maybe I've experienced a mild benefit from adopting a vegan diet, but I tend to eat pretty healthy. Like I, I do occasionally have like oil and some processed foods, but it's very rare. Like I primarily eat whole foods, uh, plant-based. So um, some vegan junk food every now and then I don't think is really going to affect me too badly. But uh, but yeah, like I don't know some people you might be more susceptible to it than others. Um, but I would, uh, yeah, I would, I would, um, echo, <laughs> um, Jutero's, um, you know, comment that for me, it's, it's gotten better. Um, so you have perfect skin now and you're happy. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you're happy. Uh, but I think your long-term health is going to be like really severely affected by that. And you should definitely try to figure out what's causing it. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't don't think that's good for you long term, man. And from the ethics and, you know, from animals and environment and everything like that, it's a horrible decision. And uh and yeah, not something I can support. But I am glad you're feeling better, but I still think you should try to get professional help to find out what's actually wrong and try to reintroduce the healthy foods, um, like the whole food plants. <clears throat> okay, um should I might get flare up if I eat junk food. Yeah, I mean things in like oil and stuff like that, that that can that can really, you know, deep fried vegan junk food is is still junk food. Like it's still not good for you. Um Brogan said he will have blood work done before and after and will be very interesting to see the results. I'm sure he's you know, his cholesterol is gonna go through the roof. I'm sure it's gonna do that. I mean thirty days is, is long enough to see some uh you know, detriment I would say. Um I so yeah, trinitarin is Accutane or Rocutane, powerful acne medication. Okay, yeah. So you are already taking medication then. Um, um, to, 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 so why are you here? Beef only sounds awful. Not to mention the poor cows. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I'm glad you're here, uh, Juice, um, and I hope you get help. <laughs> um, it's synthetic v vitamin A or something. Yeah. Okay. And I mean. Yeah, synthetic uh, vitamin A, I wonder if that you can also have problems with because you can get too much vitamin A um, if it's fat-soluble vitamin A that you're getting from uh, animal sources. So maybe maybe the medication had something to do with that. I don't know. Um, so Juice says, because I'm open to the different side, yeah, not eating for taste, but it does uh, taste good, only salt, liver health, clear my acne. Again, you know, we don't really know what's actually helped you whether there was some actual thing that was causing a problem for you uh and now you've just happened to stumble on you know some things that uh wouldn't trigger your issues uh but you could have maybe achieved that by just simply going to sweet potatoes for example or you know uh rice or or white potatoes or carrots or you know apples i don't know i'm just saying so uh yeah i don't think that's good going to be good for you long term definitely you know, look into what's really causing the issue. Okay. Um, hey, Nikki, welcome. Yeah, scurvy, that's a good point. Um, I don't know if you're eating any, uh, you know, vitamin C. Um, I think if you are eating organ meats, you're probably getting enough vitamin C, but it really depends on what you're eating. And um, I don't think that's a fun thing to mess around with. And it does take a little while to develop as well. So you should definitely um, maybe <laughs> go see somebody soon. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, yeah, you eat your meat blue or rare, yeah, I don't know if that really matters, Accutane is a strong antibiotic, that's probably not good, that's, okay, Jutero says it's not antibiotic, um, okay, well, there you go, <laughs> I don't know, I've never taken that, I don't know much about it, Frank says Accutane is also known to cause depression, again, I don't know it, but very likely, I mean, many medications have very strong side effects. White potatoes uh, even don't bother me now, but large amounts do give me some pimples. Again, I'm not telling you to eat just uh, one thing. I don't think that's actually healthy. I don't like the idea of mono meals. I'm just saying an elimination diet um, goes back a long way when you're trying to figure out something and then slowly reintroducing uh, things. The point should not be to stay on a potato-only diet or a, a rice-only diet or a whatever-only diet. I believe in eating a you know a variety of, of whole food plants and I think that's really the best thing you can do for your health because that's how you can ensure you're getting all the proper, you know, micronutrients, macronutrients, everything. Um, but 
again, like, you know, you shouldn't be taking advice from me or anybody else in the chat, and no offense meant to anybody, but you should really go see a specialist. That's that's my, my view on that. Um, Joe Rogan says he wants Ricky Gervais on his show. Guess he doesn't know what Ricky thinks of hunters. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's that's a really funny thing. I can't even imagine him uh, going, quite honestly. I, don't, I mean, I don't even follow Ricky Gervais too much, but I do see a uh, bunch of his tweets and stuff, uh, uh, you know, um, trophy hunting and stuff, and, uh, yeah, I can't imagine how he would <laughs> do on um, the Joe Rogan show. That would be kind of crazy. Because let's, let's be honest, I mean, in, for 99% of the people, like, in the world today, especially people living in, like, you know, cities and, and stuff like that, I mean, hunting is just absolutely not a necessity. Like, yes, there are people living in primitive, like, wild remote areas and whatever, and, you know, if you're living up in Alaska, like, even though it's, you know, civilized and highly developed country, because it's in the U.S. still, technically, like, yeah, you might be in some really remote areas, like, whatever, like, you know, subsistence hunting is still, like, a very real thing there, but if you're, if you're watching this in, like, the lower 48 states, like, and you're watching this on your phone or something, like, you, you probably don't really have too much of a need to, to go and, and shoot an animal in the woods, um, it's it's really about like ego and i'm sure mr rogan could afford a very healthy whole food plant-based diet if he if he chose to eat you know eat one instead of going into the woods and shooting innocent animals for no reason other than to you know boost his own manhood and ego and whatever i don't know um juice says he's german so i thought it was accutane but it was definitely some antibiotic pill well i mean antibiotics can mess up your gut biome really badly i know people will get bad diarrhea sometimes from taking antibiotics there, there could be really you know serious and very real side effects from taking uh antibiotics and you might need the antibiotics for some other kind of thing like if you're either going to die from some infection or like pneumonia or something else you're going to take the antibiotic hopefully because you know what you want to live and then it might cause other issues in your stomach so yeah you need to go and you know repopulate the good healthy bacteria and usually the best way to do that is by eating a good whole food plant-based diet but again there might be some specific things that you can do to alleviate the discomfort alleviate the issues you're having and uh i don't know if you're eating a lot of you know vegan junk food um certainly i think that's a good thing to cut out like don't be eating you know greasy vegan junk food burgers and pies and whatever i mean that's that's not gonna that's not gonna help anybody health-wise Pablo, welcome. There are many nutrients and amino acids not found in plants. <clears throat> well, show me show me which ones they are. I'm going to have to be in another time because I'm going to have to end this stream pretty soon. Um, but I would, I would very much beg to differ with you. Um, the guy takes stem cell shots and testosterone. He can afford a vegan diet. Exactly. I mean, come on. Like, I was being kind of facetious. <laughs> I'm sure he's got more money than than we'll probably ever have in our whole lives. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't think money is an issue really there. I think it's just he just wants to be cool and, and big and bad. Like, I go kill my own stuff and eat it. And I don't know. It's just crazy. Um, so you're saying you ate a whole food plant-based diet from the get-go? I mean, again... I'd have no idea what would have caused it. You really got to go see somebody. That's that's the truth. And long term, really do check your cholesterol, see what it's at now. If you have any baseline that you can compare to from before when you were eating whole food plant based, I'm I'm just confident that you're going to see a severe you know um, worsening of your uh, you know cholesterol levels, LDL especially. And you really should look into that. And again, all the stuff I just talked about at the beginning of the stream, I really think. Uh, you know, don't fall for these these uh, charlatans, these these people promoting these carnivore diets and zero carb and low carb and paleo and what have you, because they are really telling you to ignore the science and and uh, and pretend like having high cholesterol is not going to be an issue, and it will be an issue. And I don't think you know having a heart attack is going to be fun for anybody. All right, hey Jordan, welcome. Um, do, do, do Jen and the sensory deprivation tank. Oh, he has one of those too. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Did I cover Impossible Pork? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I think I saw something on Twitter that they're introducing that and they're going to be shooting for the Chinese market because I guess in China there's like pork is probably the most uh, eaten meat. And um, that I'm sure will do huge things just like the Impossible Burger. Um, but uh, no, I haven't seen it. I haven't tried it. I don't support the Impossible Burger uh, because of their uh, animal testing. I also remember the fiasco that happened that the vegan zombie uh, documented on his channel 
um, where they served their product with uh, non-vegan, so actual like dairy uh, cheese, and they lied to vegans' faces. And um, yeah, I just I don't support that company. But uh, if it means people eating less animals, I'm all for it. But I personally won't be going out and buying that uh, product, so I won't be checking out their pork product either. But but all in all, like hey, you know, if it gets people in China eating less pigs, then great. I'm I'm happy for that. Um, so, yeah, guys, I really got to run. It's getting real late here. Uh, I got to get the kids um, ready for bed with my wife and everything. And, um, yeah, so that's it. I hope you guys found this enjoyable. If you did, please remember to subscribe, uh, hit the like button, all that good stuff, share it with people. And please, if you are, you know, as in the case of Juice, like considering or already on one of these, um, you know, low-carb, keto, paleo, whatever, carnivore diets, Please review this, look through the information. I'm going to have the links. I'm going to post them right after this when, when I've ended the stream. And uh, read through the stuff yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Take blood tests. Uh, don't deny the role of cholesterol. Don't deny um, its role in heart disease. It's a very serious disease. And uh, it can take anybody. You don't have to look uh, fat. You don't have to look obese. You look at people like Pauline Quinn, who was a low-carb advocate, dead of a heart attack. You look at people like, uh, what's the guy, the bodybuilder? Uh, shoot, I can't remember his name. Died really young, 20-something years old. Uh, can't remember his name. Died of a heart attack. It's <laughs> like, you look at all these people, like, eating all these high-fat, high you know, animal products. Uh, what's the guy, the, the biggest loser guy, the trainer, something Harper, Bob Harper, whatever the guy's name is. You know, didn't die, but huge heart attack. You know, it's like, people can drop dead of heart attacks even when they look incredibly fit when they you know they they can look amazing they can feel amazing they don't know they don't feel that their heart is literally struggling and you know the plaque is building up so yeah don't don't just take my word for it go get your blood tested go to see a specialist and uh yeah do your own reading man like that's all i can say so um thanks nikki thanks jen thanks Jutoro. i really appreciate the super chats <laughs> that was really cool thank you very much and um, yeah, just goodbye everybody. Bye Frank. Bye everybody. Uh, thanks for being on. Um, yeah, Juice. Hope you get some help, man. And uh, you know, reach out. Send me an email if if you want. I can send you links or whatever to to check out. But again, you shouldn't take my word for it, man. Go go see somebody. Go see an actual specialist. All right. See you guys. Bye.